and those, these women have a right. Like giving them responsibility for their own stuff is a necessary part of their growth, and they have the right to fuck themselves up. Yeah. And when we interfere, we deprive them of that growth experience. It's like that with your kids. You have kids, right? Remember seeing that? Right. How old are your kids now? 21 and 16. Okay. So you must have felt what it's like to want to step in and do it for them, right? And then, but then let them struggle with it, like tying their shoelaces or, as, you know, from way back. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And, and they'll learn better if they do it. It's going to take a lot more time, but it's, they'll learn better. They have to do it themselves. Like you can't just keep doing it for them. Welcome to the Masculine Psychology Podcast, where we answer key questions in relationships, attraction, success, and fulfillment. Now, here's your host, world-renowned therapist and life coach, David Tian. Okay, Ryan. So I got some of the intake forms. Okay. So I have sort of a background. But right. Hopefully, you can just let me know, um, how can I help you? Well, I mean, I don't know, like I've uh, been on a bit, on a bit of a uh, journey, I guess, to a certain degree since my uh, end of my marriage last, um, in July last year. I was with uh, a partner of mine that uh, had a lot of trauma in her life. And I was um, I was aware of it, and um, and I was encouraging her to work on herself and de- deal with that stuff. But she always kind of worked on you know her her business, her career was uh, you know kind of the forefront. It was, it was her it was her image, right? It was very it was uh, it, it was a lot of her, right? And and I always kind of thought. And I think what happened was is that when I was younger, I I had done some work. I was brought into counseling when I was quite young, like in my teenage, because I was quite a handful and, uh, and, uh, you know, all things were, so I was in the, I guess in the care of the government ministry to a certain degree for, for counseling and stuff like that. And, uh, so I guess I always thought after I was done that, that I was done, right? Like I had fixed myself, I was done, right? So I was good and, and off I went. But I think, uh, after our relationship ended and, uh, you know, I became aware of some things, then I realized that I needed to work on myself. So it's kind of what, what happened. I went down, um, I tried, uh, the family systems therapy, I think so, the IF, IFS. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I connect with one guy uh, for that. I think he was fairly new to it. We just didn't really connect. Um, I did about two, maybe three sessions with him and I just, I just didn't, uh, connect with him. So like I was seeing another counselor. So what happened, what, what happened, our, our marriage started to unravel. And in January of last year, I started to try to get some help for myself to try to help dealing with her because I knew she had trauma and I knew that I was not doing very well at managing her, uh, maybe not her, but just being there for her and understanding. So I ended up at a, at a counseling uh, thing, which is basically with the university here. It's very cheap and reasonable. And I was at with him and uh and then him and i were seeing each other for quite some time but then he said that he was seeing actually a psychoanalysis or is that correct so uh, so yeah psychoanalysis and uh so then he said i should reach out to for something like that so i ended up that's what i ended up doing is i found that and i've been working with one with uh, him since august of last of last year so we've been seeing each other weekly for for the, basically that whole time period and it's been pretty good actually for for me to start to see what my, you know, when I was, when we were first, me and my partner were first separated, I really started to dive into trauma and just seeing how I essentially fucked up. Right. Because, you know, I cared for her and, I, and it hurt to, to lose her. So, and then as I was going through that stuff, then all of a sudden I kind of just realized to myself, well, like we we're talking about triggers and I was like, I've got triggers. Like I just couldn't, you know, all of a sudden just kind of click with me. I'm like, you know, I'm pretty cool, chill, calm all the time. But then something happens and I go from zero to 60 and I'm losing my marbles and I could never. And so then I just realized that I have some triggers. And so then him and I worked through some things with that. And then, uh, through work, you know, on emergency services. So we have this, uh, I went to this, like a first retreat responder program uh, thing for, for four days. And, uh, you know, that was pretty helpful as well. Connecting with, you know, other individuals, it was group therapy. And, uh, so yeah, so it's just kind of been going down the road with that. So when you said that you were bringing people on, I was like, well, it's just another, you know, step in the right direction essentially. And, and I've been following you for a very long time. I, uh, back, uh, you know, back 15, you know, 2015, 16 range when you were maybe not necessarily where you're at now. 
And then I just kind of kept on following you through the years and seeing you progress and progress and stuff like that. So obviously when I seen the opportunity, I was like, well, certainly it's not going to hurt. So I don't know what we can take from this, but I mean, I certainly can dive in my story a bit and, and try to help you understand where I'm at to a certain degree and then kind of go from there, I guess. Oh, great. Well, it's great to connect with you. And it's flattering that you've been following me since 2015. That's cool. So great. I, I kind of have a background now of where you're at. I'm still not sure what, um, how can I help you? Like, so uh, do you have any, do you have a goal or an outcome or, or result? Well, yeah. I mean, obviously I want to get, um, I want to be able to understand my myself better so that I can manage dealing with uh, people, my family to a certain degree. Dealing with people. Yeah. Like sometimes I can, you know, I have, that's one of the things that came out of that. My therapist is that I have a very high standard of men and if they don't meet that, that standard, I just, I don't really have a lot of use for them or I get upset if I'm dealing with people in life when they don't have a certain level of standard or ethics to a certain degree. What's that like? How do you notice that in your day-to-day life, the, this high standard? Well, it's, it's frustrating. Well, when does it know? come into play? Like when was the last time someone didn't meet this standard? Well, I mean, I'd give you an example and it doesn't necessarily have to be men, but, but lots of times it is when they're, when people are driving and they just, or like to give this is one example that's come up is that when I'm say I'm driving and someone does something that you know there's rules the rules to follow and then they're not following it clearly and they're you know say they finger me or something like that well then I'm I've lost it like I'm losing my marbles right or if oh, I'm dealing strangers. with strangers like people that yeah, you don't strangers. have a relationship with even then yeah to a certain degree yeah for sure yeah probably more strangers yeah more strangers oh, I would, so yeah, what did I you would, do in that uh, so you lose your marbles and then what do you do as a result well I mean. I can think of two times that I've, uh, it's gotten pretty elevated that, uh, you know, it was almost like a Dukes of Hazard chase through town uh, one time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I remember after I was done, I just sat down and I was like, what in the world just happened there? Like, I just, there was no reason for that, right? Like to get that level. Mm-hmm. Right. So, in, but that was awful. In your email, one of the emails to me or the, the, the team, you mentioned that the high standard you've discovered that the high standard you have for men is related to your father not being there or being having a low standard for himself? Well, I think because he didn't involve himself in, in my life. So my, my mom and him were, you know, divorced or separated when I was quite young. I want to say it was, it was what, around a year. And then, you know, so then, you know, I, I don't doubt that my mom made it difficult probably for him to be involved, but he never did, right? He was never involved in my life. So, yeah, so I guess basically what that's one of the things that we've talked about with the therapist, he says that, you know, because, you know, that he didn't, because, and it has a bit to do with, because with my kids, I've been involved with my kids' life. So I have that expectation. So like when it happened in my situation, I stepped up to the plate and no matter, even though their mothers made life a little difficult for me, I still was in their life the whole time. Right. So, so it was important to me back then for that not sure why but now knowing you know obviously not having my father to step up and be involved and and whatnot was a problem right yeah makes tons of sense so when you see another man with a low standard for himself like giving you the bird in the car mm-hmm. uh, you're actually reacting to your father possibly i'd be mean, I'm, I'm all ears Oh, that's your now. I thought that was your now. I thought I was just. Re- oh no, no I'm, not, I'm not saying. I'm, not, I'm just. Uh, it's just that I have a very high expectation. Well, that um, ma- that makes sense. It's because this, but you hurt yourself in the process. Like you're not actually making anything better. Like that's what yeah. I was asking. What's the actual yeah. outcome? Like if you had a high standard for other people, and you yeah. saw some man raping a woman in the alley, and as a result of this high standard, you stepped in and saved her. Yeah. That would be. That's great. I don't see any problem with that high standard. That's a good standard. But in your case, the high standard just hurts you more and doesn't actually make the world a better place. So then yeah, this is obviously yeah, no. exaggerated. And we're trying to understand why you'd like kind of even blank out because uh, you kind of come to after the mm-hmm. hazard chase. And, yeah, and, and it's not even like I'm not even, it's not that I've, I'm blanking out. I'm fully in control of what's going on to a certain degree. Like, you know, like I remember the whole thing and just essentially elevating it after but i remember just like after it was done and i just sat down and i was just like wow like that was like i could have been caught on you know someone could have videotaped that right i could have been you know there was so so many things could have happened so in ifs this would be called a firefighter part who comes on okay and Mm -hmm. these all of these parts are 
children parts, all right? So they're reacting to whatever happened back way back then. So it makes a lot right. of sense if the misplaced anger that should be directed towards your father is now directed towards various father type figures, which is all men, I suppose. And especially the, the less you know about them, I guess the easier it is to project that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems like you're already exploring that with your uh, current therapist. So that's great. Yeah. I'm becoming a little bit more less reactive for sure. Great. Yeah. Well, how's your relationship with your father now? I don't have, I've never, never ever had a relationship with my father. Is he, he alive? Well, he passed away back in about 2018, 19, give or take. And uh, yeah, so I've never been in contact with him. Like never spoke with him, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And again, I just don't really have a lot of respect for him now after that as well, because at that point he had four other kids. So I have essentially four other, have, you know, brothers, and sisters, and, and they had been reaching out to me at that time when he was passing away. And, you know, it just, he had a chance to make it right. And he didn't even reach out then. So, and he, you know, at the end of the day, he just didn't conduct himself. Like he just, yeah, he just kind of left me high and dry. So it's like, I don't know, like, is what it is. Sounds like you've got a, a lot of unprocessed resentment and anger. Yeah. Do you have any, are you going through anything to, to process that? No. I don't think so. I mean, I think I'm just becoming aware of it. To be honest oh, with you. great. Yeah. Awareness is the first and necessary step. Mm -hmm. Have you been to his, does he have a tombstone or a grave? No, I didn't even, didn't even bother to nothing like that at all. Just, uh, just basically for me, it was like, well, it obviously kind of puts the final nail in the, in the, in the whole situation. So, Sorry, what puts it, uh, his passing puts well, it? His passing and not him even reaching out or, you know, mm -hmm. even leaving. Like, and it's not, it's really not has anything to do with, like, I'm, I've, I'm well off. So it's not like I need financial support from him, but he never did financially support me when I was growing up. Like he never paid child support or got to my mom. We struggled back then, but now, you know, I've had a career for, I've been in my career for almost 30 years. So, you know, I'm set to a certain degree. But just not even maybe including me in the will to say, hey, you know, you you matter. Not that I needed that. That's not that it's not the financial aspect of it. Yeah, I can hear the, the anger and the resentment, which is completely reasonable. Uh, um, everything. I think anyone listening would be on your side uh, as you're describing it. And yet he's passed, <clears throat> so to some degree he's got some kind of peace. But mm -hmm. you're still holding this burden of him. He's haunting your mind. I mean, this wouldn't matter to you. You wouldn't care this much unless you wanted to be loved by your biological father, which we all do. Sure. And that's why it hurts so much. Right. So I'm probably not fully mad at him to a certain degree because, you know, I know my mom and, uh, you know, she doesn't make things easy. And, you know, she probably encouraged or made it difficult for him to even think about that because she moved, a, you know, a, a large, you know, a fairly large distance away. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, she plays a part in this as well. Mm -hmm. And how, so, how's your relationship with your mom now? Um, you know, my mom and I have never ever, you know, for the most part ever had a very good relationship. So you don't see her much now, right? I try to see her as little, I try to see her as little as possible. We used to see more each other more when the kids were younger, but the old boys are quite a bit older now, right? They're, you know, they're mm -hmm. well on their way. So they're doing their own thing. So, and she's just so frustrating to be around sometimes. Right. Okay. So, well, one of the things that we would do if we were in an ongoing therapeutic relationship would be to have a way to speak to the dad in your mind and the mom in your mind. Mm -hmm. You have, your mom is still here, so you could, you could have those conversations with her in real life. And right. of course, the, it wouldn't require her to respond in any way, because this is you, with these parts of you that are holding these resentments, being able to offload right. them. In Gestalt therapy, there's a, a really uh, great technique called the empty chair technique. So if your therapist knows how to do that sort of thing, then that would be also a great way to process this. But you're already on the way. You're you're on that first step of awareness and noticing how it affects your life now in the day to day. Right. Yeah. And all of this uh, anger towards your father and your mother, your mother also for demonizing your father to you. And this is a kind of we now know that this is a sort of a child abuse where you're demonizing the other parent, uh, especially if it's a, it's the same gender as you, the parent that's being demonized. Right. Uh, we internalize all of that. 
and uh, like half of you DN by DNA, and we know this instinctively, is the biological other, the father or the mother, whoever's being demonized. So she's right. kind of as she's attacking the father without him being there to you as a child. To some degree, you must feel that as an attack on yourself, that that half of you, anyway, that you've inherited biologically. So all of that's going on, and this is all, it seems like, unprocessed resentment, and we haven't moved to the stage of kind of like grief yet, is that right. anger is still below the surface. Okay. Well, I think you're doing great. You're making good progress on this. Yeah, I think I've come a long way in the last year or so, for sure. Definitely more in the last... Um, like since January, February, for sure. And then with this therapist now, I would say the last six weeks has been where he, you know, he's, you know, obviously as he's dialing it down and, and we're starting to talk about things, then yeah, I'm starting to, the stuff I sent to you, right. It's starting to makes a lot of sense to me. Right. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I guess to be honest with you, like uh, in my career, to be honest with you, when I first started my job, I, I was very, it's always been the job that I wanted and it's not. And then when I got there, it was actually partly one of the biggest disappointments of my life because the people, the men that were I worked with, were not, high, you know, they're not a lot of them are very good, high quality people, right? There were a lot of bullies and probably people dealing with their own shit to a certain degree. So about the first five, eight years of that, I actually contemplated leaving that and going and doing something else. But now we've, you know, people have left, retired, moved on, and we fired more intelligent people and and. The atmosphere around there is definitely improved. So that makes me, when I go to work now, at least I go to work, I enjoy when I go there. That sounds great. And you're a first responder, so you're in EMS, emergency services. Yeah. All right. Good. Is there anything else that I can help you with? Looks like the psychoanalysis is, is serving you well so far. Yeah, I, th I think so. Um, yeah, I, I guess in the day it is. I don't know a lot about IFS therapy and everything like that. Like I know you talk about it lots in your podcasts and, and I hear about these parts and everything like that. And I wonder, like you talked about the firefight, was the firefight, right? That that part there, you know, I, I feel that a lot coming out. Oh, when was the last time? You mentioned it when you were in the car and this guy gave you the middle finger and so that was that was like a firefighter part who kinda of took over. Uh, yeah, or if I'm dealing with just dealing with people that are unreasonable, you know, like I really believe in fairness to a certain degree. Like I really bother me when people don't treat me fairly because I really believe in treating others very fairly. That sounds great. What was the example like that? What happened in life, real life? Well, I mean, uh, just a good example, like even just uh, earlier today at work, a, a person we were, we were having a discussion and, you know, it wasn't really one, wasn't like two, both ways. And he kept on cutting me off. And then saying essentially what I was saying was wrong. And I got to the point where I was just like, it was, I could feel I was getting, I could feel I was getting elevated. And I basically was calling out on it. Like, I'm like, you know, I work with 120 other men here and uh, not a lot of them cut me off like you are right now. You know, you're not really listening, you know, like, and uh, I could just feel like I was, you know, my old self was about ready to come out. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And really lose it to a certain degree. Right. Do we, we, you understand that this is a, that degree of anger is directed at your father? No, I don't, but okay. I'd be curious to know more. Okay, good. So we can do some work here. So part of what I'm careful with on these one off sessions is if we do this deeper inner work and we don't have an ongoing relationship, then we, I can't follow up. Um, See how so usually what we need to do is establish a trusting relationship between us. And then right. we can do more of this parts work. But we can speak directly to the protectors that don't understand this firefighter. Right. So so let's do that. So right. let's just point out that this is above and beyond what is necessary in this case. I suspect, but let me learn more about it. Yeah. Why did you have to have this conversation? Was there supposed to be some kind of decision made as a result of the conversation? Not really a decision made uh, from it, but it was about... Um... It was just about, uh, it, was, it was basically, it was, a, it was a conversation amongst a whole bunch of people to a certain degree. And I, when I'm talking to people a lot of times, I, I do appreciate actually people giving their two bits and I might actually learn something, but that's not what I was getting from this particular well, individual. Is this particular individual allowed to have his own like opinions that differ from yours? Sure, absolutely. And is he allowed to be a jerk? I mean, does the, the law in Canada protect 
his right to be a jerk or an asshole, like without breaking any criminal, like yeah, actually. I'm curious. Yeah, I guess it's just fine to be. Yeah, sure. Okay, right. So healthy boundaries are when we take responsibility for our own actions, mm-hmm. words, beliefs, feelings, and we don't take responsibility for other adults' actions, beliefs, uh, feelings. Okay. So unfortunately, in, or fortunately, <laughs> in Canada, he's allowed to be a dick. Fair enough. And you're allowed to not hang out with him. That's why I was asking, is this a necessary work? Well, you do spend time. Yeah, we can't get away from each other, right? Like, we have to. Well, could you have gone to the bathroom at that point? No. No, I couldn't have, actually. Oh, oh, were you stuck in a car with him or something? Yeah. Okay, and did you have to talk or listen to him? Oh, it's pretty standard that we all are listening to each other. Oh, it was all of you? Yeah. How many were in the car or the vehicle? Four. Four. And... Have you ever had a situation where the other two or three people are having a conversation and you're just thinking about something else, like you're, where you got to go for dinner or thinking mm-hmm. about... Not really, because you're on headsets, so then, you know, you're kind of all... Oh, you're on headsets. Yeah, so if you just took the headset sort of off your ear, would that have been... That would, been, be, that would have been weird. Would you have gotten in trouble? Like, is that against... Not trouble, but people would be like, you know, this is... Do you have the right in your job... Because you, you definitely have the right in Canada to take headphones off, but it's your yeah. job. You have the right to do that. Yeah, for sure. So people will think it's weird. They would. If people they think would. it's weird if you're exercising your rights. I mean, does it matter if they think it's weird? If you have the right to do it, you choose to do it. And that's your responsibility to choose whether to exercise your right or not. Just like he sure. can choose to exercise his right to be a dick. You can choose mm-hmm. your to exercise your right not to listen. Yeah, I guess to a certain degree. But See, when you're... When what you're happens trapped, then is... Unhealthy boundaries mean, I'm cutting you off, hopefully I can trigger something okay. so you can come out and get to know him better. So unhealthy boundaries are when you want that, you need that guy to treat you a certain way for you to feel good. Right. And it's his right, I mean, healthy boundaries are he's allowed to be a dick and you're allowed to shut it off, like to not listen. Okay. Now, if he's aggressively attacking your space, your physical person, then that's sure. an actual crime. And luckily in Canada, that would be a crime. And in fact, if he threatened, even if he were to threaten to do so, that would be a crime. Right. That would be assault. But if he's not threatened to punch you or to attack you in any way, and he hasn't actually physically attacked you, then you have the, it's your responsibility to take care of your own stuff. So essentially not react. Yeah, put your mind elsewhere or your body elsewhere if you can't. I mean, that would be mm. even better because we have to put up with dicks. Yeah. I mean, no, like, <laughs> they have the right to be however they are. We have the right to disagree with each other. And that's sort of a civil society. I mean, if, if we didn't, that would be a totally different type of political system. And unfortunately, part of that is they have the freedom to disagree with us and to piss us off. And so do we. Sure. Yeah. So part of getting along in a society is dealing with other people's rights to be assholes. Yeah, that's something I have to wrap my brain around because that definitely does drive me crazy. Because you could take that right away from them. And then what would result is either a dictatorship in which it would be great if you were the dictator and you could tell that guy to, to whatever, do whatever you want him to do. And that might be a power trip for a while. Might be a weird dystopian society for you. Yeah. But otherwise, yeah. it's like some other guy is the dictator and you're the bitch, right? And so you have to do whatever the other person... So hopefully you pick a more egalitarian society in which people have the right to be assholes. Or like in your view, they're assholes. Yeah. And healthy yeah. boundaries are where you just take care of your own feelings and actions as a result of their feelings and actions. Right. So then it becomes the question of how much do you let them affect you? Yeah, that is definitely something can get to me, for sure. Mm, right. So nothing good comes out of it, right? It seems like there wasn't any point or any purpose to arguing with this guy. Correct. You're not getting any more money. There's not going to be any kind of good outcome. No. Nope. That In that sense, you notice that that anger is misplaced. Like, it's not getting you. It's not effective in getting okay. any of your goals. Okay. How do I handle that, though? Well, in that sense, now you can see this is your dad. It's not this guy. You're angry at your dad, but you can't get, you can't direct it to him because you haven't. You haven't even gone to spit on his grave yet. And that might be one thing you can do. You can go to the grave or whatever he, his remains are, or even if it's in your mind, that would be the empty chair in a sense, and spit venom at him because that's where it's supposed to be directed. But instead, because it's missed, you're not allowed to, you're repressing it. You're just sort of shrugging it off. Like, yeah, well, whatever. 
As a result, it bursts out in these ineffective ways at people who sort of resemble your dad. These are minor assholes. And it doesn't serve you. It doesn't get you anything. No. And it's not pleasant for you. It's not probably enjoyable. To some, sometimes it is. Like when you, for me, sometimes when I go off on somebody, it's sort of like enjoyable. I'm putting them in their place and we're getting some kind of effect. Like I'm now going to get good service or I'm now going to get the manager here and I'm going to get something. Or I'm going to get a yep. free steak or something. Mm-hmm. And I get it. And that's the reason why I'm doing it. But if, if I'm just sounding off for no reason, then it's like a lot of effort for me. Like what? I just put my, I just did extra work for, and I got nothing out of it. And I got annoyed. Yeah, being annoyed is isn't pleasant, right? So you can notice that this part of you, now hopefully I can help these protectors understand the firefighter more, that when the firefighter comes online, he's actually trying to direct it towards the rightful place, the rightful object of his anger, which is your father and your mother. And until that happens, you're going to, it'll be just triggered by all kinds of things that resemble them, whether mm. resemble their treatment of you or resemble how you view them. Right. So that mm-hmm. makes sense? Yeah, that was uh, one of the things actually, ironically enough, when I was at that first responder retreat that uh, they talked about that I needed to work on having health relationships with men and women because of my past. No matter their physical strength, for many men, emotions are too much for them to handle. It's why they can't give women the deeper levels of emotional intimacy and connection that they crave. It's why they fail to be the man that modern women desire most, a man with inner strength. A man who has mastered his emotions. Find out how to master your emotions through David Tian's Emotional Mastery Program. The Emotional Mastery Program is a step-by-step system that integrates the best of empirically verified psychotherapy methods and reveals how to master your internal state and develop the inner strength that makes you naturally attractive, happy, and fulfilled. Learn more about this transformational program by going to davidtnphd.com slash emotional mastery. That's D-A-V-I-D-T-I-A-N-P-H-D.com slash emotional mastery. Right. So you can work on it from the here and now angle of actual men and women. And then the psychotherapeutic angle is to work on your relationship with your father and your mother in your mind. And then that would naturally automatically free up this these burdens that you're carrying that infect your relationships with men and women now. It'll be harder to just focus on your relationships with men and women now without having done uh, the work in the, the sources dad. and the roots. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But it seems like uh, your therapist is leading you there. I mean, sounds like the last six weeks, that, like you mentioned, he's getting mm-hmm. there. So yep. um, don't want to jump the gun too far here. But does that make sense with that part that explodes? Or I don't, I don't know what the word you use, but... Kind of Come comes, comes to your defense about fairness and unreasonableness. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's definitely something that happens. Good. All right. Well, my view is that you don't need any fixing, right? There's like nothing wrong with you, just sort of in process. Like one of the things you mentioned with was uh, being disappointed that there were bullies and then that there were men dealing with their own shit. I think everyone's dealing with their own shit. Just like yeah. how well do they keep it together <laughs> in the day-to-day life? So we're all in, in process. You seem to be in process and going through making good progress. No, I, I noticed, like, since I came back from the first, especially from the first responder retreat, I notice it now, especially at work or even when I'm dealing with people, I can now see when people are triggered or, or there's some issues going on. And I'm a lot more empathetic, ironically enough, when I'm dealing, even with my mom, to a certain degree, I've been a little bit more empathetic towards her when she acts the way she does. Because I'm thinking to myself, I'm trying to think, well, you know, I look back to her her past, how she was raised with her parents, and I, I know that it was not very good. So then they, now I understand that she's got some things that she's holding on to that she's never going to deal with. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's when they come out. Yeah. And I'm just like, better at understanding it, for sure. More empathetic, for sure. Well, that's amazing. That changes everything. That's great. So I, I was saying that to kind of give you this view that, I don't see anything wrong that needs fixing. So you might seem like there was an assumption that here I am and make me better. <laughs> so unless you give me a goal that you want to aim to, uh, for, I don't mm-hmm. really know what to, to fix. I mean, we could just, I'm curious how right. life is and uh, where, where you are in BC, you know, that kind of thing. I, I don't see anything wrong with you. <laughs> you know what I mean? So 
these were, aren't going to be things that are wrong or need fixing or that I don't think anyone's like done with their growth uh, as a human being. So it seems like you're getting a, a reasonable handle on these the anger issues and how they go back to your dad and your mother. Is there anything else that you I can help you with? Like, I think a little bit like for me over the years when I've picked my partners, uh, the, 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 the girls I've been with that they, you know, essentially the white knight syndrome to a certain degree where I go in there and it's like, I dust them off. You know, they, I know there's some issues and, and I recognize it and I'm, you know, I've to a certain degree and I'm thinking myself, well, you know, if I'm just really caring and show them love and, and I dust them off and everything's gonna be okay, but I'm attracted for some reason I keep on. That's what I've done in my, you know, I've had four long term relationships and I've always been drawn to, or, or I've ended up with those type of girls that, you know, have had issues with their fathers or, you know, the last one with trauma from stuff that's, you know, that's not her fault, but then they, I, I, somehow I get drawn to that and I just want to be able to somehow figure out why I do that, why I am drawn to these people when I also really... in your, your career choice. Yeah. You're <laughs> helping people in emergencies, like in desperate need. Yep. So, it's, yeah, this is, it's very noble. So again, I, there's nothing wrong with that. The desire to, how do you put it, give care and show people love and to be attracted to people who could use you, like that you have a role to play. But it hasn't been, but it hasn't been successful though. I mean, I, none of the relationships were successful because then they, you know, have those issues to a certain degree. I couldn't fix, couldn't fix them. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You know, so, and you know. Um, how does it feel to let people go through their stuff without interfering? <laughs> I have a tough time with it. Yeah. So it's sort of like even when you see unfairness, maybe not even directed towards you, but maybe do, do you get, does that part that gets active or activated or triggered with anger feel that way when he sees somebody else bullying yeah. someone else? 100%. Mm -hmm. And is there a good outcome as a result of that anger? Do you like step in and stop the bully? Step in. And, uh, you know, I'm not scared to use my words to get people's attention and, uh, and whatnot. Yeah, I've done it many times. Mm hmm. And you're very effective at it. I mean, you've been in this this career where you're helping people and with urgent needs uh, for decades. So yep. you've been it's effective, and you've been rewarded for it, and it's been to some degree fulfilling. Otherwise, yes. you've chosen it as a career. So right. isn't it, is it any wonder why you would recreate this dynamic, or you would experience this dynamic also in relationships? So okay, it's, it's not Fair just enough. happening in your in your intimate relationships. It's like your whole life. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, that's. So thank God there are people like you. I mean, like, uh, so first of all, you have to appreciate the goodness in it. I think when you call it a white knight syndrome, and I, I made videos with that title, <laughs> yeah. we kind of shit on it. Like, oh, this guy's needy or something like this, a bad thing. But I'm, I want to make sure that we reframe it as neither bad nor good. And that there are, because there's good things in it and there's bad things in it. Yeah. Right. So we want to appreciate the good to start. Like, we're not going to throw it out. Throw out the you know baby with the bathwater in this case. No, for sure. But I mean, at the end of the day, like you know, I'm no different than anyone else. That I would like to have a successful relationship where it's a safe place and you have someone there, right? So, so now we're going back to when it gets you in trouble, right? So even that earlier example of someone cutting you off and saying you were wrong, mm -hmm. and then getting angry as a result of that, uh, without any outcome, you know, without any good result from that confrontation. Notice then we were talking about how they have a right to be this way. Right. And those, these women have a right, like giving them responsibility for their own stuff is a necessary part of their growth. And they have the right to fuck themselves up. Yeah. And when we interfere, we deprive them of that growth experience. It's like that with your kids. You have kids, yep. right? Remember yep. seeing that? Right. How old are your kids now? 21 and 16. Okay. So you must have felt what it's like to want to step in and do it for them, right? And then, but to let them struggle with it, like tying their shoelaces or, as, you know, from way back. Yeah. You yeah. Know, and, and they'll learn better if they do it. It's going to take a lot more time, but it's, they'll learn better. They have to do it themselves. Like you can't just keep doing it for them. Yeah. So that kind of good parenting rather than a paternalism of always stepping in and doing it for them is the right balance when it comes to being with women who need helping. Right. And it's hard for me to, to sit back and watch when I know that they're 
doing stuff that's one hurting our relationship or themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, part of the attraction to it is because there are parts of you that are very young that are wishing mom and dad would come in and actually have saved you back then. And to some degree, you must have then developed a desire to save them from themselves. And all of those are unresolved. Like, because right. as a child, you can't save them and they couldn't, they didn't step up and save you. So mm -hmm. all of this lack of resolution is finding itself in the most intimate relationships that you have and in your day to day as well, but uh, definitely in your intimate relationships. Yep. So if we had an ongoing therapeutic relationship, that would be the sort of direction we could go in is discovering the parts of you that were desperate for dad, of course, and then also desperate for mom to stop being the way she is and to be the way that you wanted her to be and needed yeah. her to be. Right. And now you're doing it for yourself and you're doing it for others. So you're reenacting this savior cycle and you'll feel this growth that you've reached this turning point when you can see somebody else struggling and they you resist your help. If it was easy for you to help, like literally somebody's like falling off a cliff and you just like put your hand out and then pull them up. That's fine. Like, if, in fact, if your saving was helping them with relatively little effort from you, this would be great. But the problem happens when they resist and they have this cycle that keeps them going back, right? And you can't save them. And the this achiever in you, the, you must have multiple achiever parts. <laughs> they have to experience the futility of it. And for my parts, it was like, there's a scene in, it's very geeky, in Star Trek, <laughs> The Next Generation, the Picard one with the Patrick Stewart. And there's yeah, this, oh, great. Okay, same generation. <laughs> and uh, there's this whole, there's like season finale where he's taken over by the Borg and they mm -hmm. use him to destroy their our, our mod or whatever, like over 2,000 soldiers die in this thing. And then afterwards, after they rescue him, he goes to his vineyard where his brother is in France or something on Earth. They're wrestling with each other in the middle of all this, these grapes, you know, and then they get in the ground and then he start. they're laughing because this is ridiculous. But then he starts to cry. It's this beautiful laughing into crying. And he starts hitting the ground and says something like, uh, I wasn't strong. Enough. I couldn't stop them. He's just crying. And then it, his older brother is just looking at him and being there, I guess, holding the space we call it now. <laughs> and then afterwards says, well, Jean-Luc, you can deal with it here or you can deal with it up there in the Enterprise which would you have? Because he's like, I'm going to retire. I'm just going to go back to this vineyard. And, and his brother knows that this is him just escaping this and he's going to live with this trauma. He's going to have to live with this trauma, this unresolved, these unresolved issues. They're going to have to work themselves out. But what are you going to do with your life in the meantime? And can you go directly to attack it? And so part of what the achievers will feel is that very futility. I wasn't strong enough. I couldn't stop them. I couldn't yeah. save them. No yeah. matter what I do, it just wasn't enough. And we have to recognize that. And that is true. And it yeah. feels like shit. And you're going to hit the ground and you're going to maybe punch the wall and do everything you can. I'm sure given the length of your career, you must have been in situations where you couldn't save the person that you got a call for. And it must have been just, it's a funny thing when it comes to that stuff that I'm a very realistic uh, of that. I guess probably from the time and the job to a certain degree. You have an idea what when you're actually you're you know you're actually going to be able to make some sort of a, a difference in those times where there's nothing that we could have done. So I'm very realistic about that. There, uh, I don't take. I feel like I don't take a lot of that. I don't feel like I've had those situations over my head. But when you, you just said what you said there, I felt that after my relationship ended in uh, last year. Mm -hmm. So that the one that you're actually trying to save is yourself, the little inner child or your child parts, and that you can save them, but you can't save her. No. How are you feeling now? What's coming up? I see some sadness. Is it okay to feel that? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, just hold it there. See how long you can just stay with that and let those parts of you that are feeling sad know that you're here. You're listening. You're with them. And you understand. It was sad. And you're big enough to hold it. Yeah, let it through. Good. And if these tears could speak, what would they say? That I have 
grief, but um, I feel a lot of regret. Feel a lot of regret. Yeah. And what is it that is regrettable? <laughs> the relationship ending that I could have been more understanding. And how could you have been more understanding? Like, what would that have looked like? Um, I just could have been more empathetic. Um, she said she didn't feel safe, not physically, but safe to near the end to share her feelings. And that hurt. That I wasn't there. That went. I look back on it now, and it's, it was could have been so easy for me to do, but I didn't. At that point, you were already thinking about the divorce, or had you filed yet? Or no, no, that was that was before she probably even had left. And what were you afraid of then? That had you pulled back. Or worried about? Well, obviously losing the person that I care about. And... Oh, I mean, uh, you said you, you could have been more empathetic. Yeah. What was keeping you from being more empathetic? Oh, I was just, I know, I was tired. I was caregiver fatigue, I guess is what it was called, that I probably had. And uh... It's draining being with someone yeah. who's... It's very draining. Trauma. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. How is she doing now? Do you know? With the trauma, I mean. You no, know, I don't know anything. How is she doing? We don't really, we don't communicate right now. We haven't communicated, uh, she doesn't communicate with me in a very, very long time. Oh, was that last year's? You, you had a marriage that ended yeah. last year. Yeah. That, that's the one you're talking about, right? Yes. That's the first. Okay. And these, uh, your kids are with a different woman, right? Yeah. Yeah, they're previous. Okay. Well, a year is not that long. I mean, you're old enough to know. <laughs> no, it's not. It goes no. by fast. <laughs> it does, yeah. Very. Like you can, you know how, what it's like. I, I can see that you love somebody, but you can't save them. Yeah. That's but, definitely what I feel. But you can still love them and re recognize that they have to do this work for themselves. Oh, yeah. Some words that won't. No, that's right. And that's the part that's hard to take is you can see that that's what needs to be done, but you can't. Yeah, make them. And then you think, obviously, the rest of your life, too. Like, living like that just would be hard. Like, I don't think I could do it. So it's not healthy for me either, right? Mm hmm Yes. Having to right. deal with those things over and over again. I feel for her. Like, I know that what she's going through is real. I fully believe that that's real, what she's going through. I just wish that she would put the importance on herself enough to work on that stuff besides having to be successful in her career. Mm -hmm. career. She, I, you know, I always said if she just put 20% of the effort into herself compared to what she did to into her career, that that would go a long way. Yeah. Well, that's my sweet spot. Uh, most of my clientele are exactly like that. They sacrifice their personal happiness for their career goals or to make more money. Yeah. Or, yeah, I mean, obviously money is a driver, but also it's, it's her image. It's uh, oh right, significance. Best. Yeah, absolutely. Be the best. Of course, these are part of their own demons that they're not aware of. But it's that society celebrates these burdens, so it's hard for them to see. Yeah. So I guess the theme here is being able to still love somebody while watching them struggle necessarily because they have to do it, and sometimes they they won't succeed in that struggle. Yeah, and that's what I tell myself all the time is that, I, you know, I do care for her and I do love her and I want nothing but the best for her. But it's it's hard to stand back and watch what's happened over the last year with her. Mm -hmm. So, well, something you can take into your, your own therapy work uh, going forward 
or something to ponder is I thought you were crying because you were with this inner child part and it was breaking to to the the idea or the thoughts that it was really hard back then that you couldn't save. You couldn't save the parents. You couldn't save yourself then and they weren't going to come to save you. So this driving need to save others was actually coming from your very young parts that need saving that were forced into a kind of fixing role. That takes time. That's a very, it should be a gentle process as you ease into it to discover these parts of you that are trapped back there trying to finally fix things. Right. When that gets resolved, because that, that, then you can be there for these inner child parts, then the more compulsive attraction to people who need fixing will start to become healthier or more manageable. But it, it shouldn't go away because it's actually quite noble to want to help people. But it'll be more like like how you are in your professional capacity. Be able to step away from it and not hold it. Yeah. It's really hard. I, as a past fixer, I can tell you, it's like watching somebody drown. But in quicksand, like you can't, if you go in there, it'll actually enable them to a certain degree yeah. and then you'll get sucked in. So you can offer a stick, you can offer them the open door, like here it is, anytime you want to come through, I'm over here. Right. That's why I'm saying like, you don't have to cut yourself off completely. If if you love this person, you can still have like, here's the lifeline, but you have to take it. And you have to do this work to continue to hold it. I can't do it for you. Right. And it is a sad thing when you watch someone you love struggle like that. But that's part of what loving it means. Yeah, it's been a hard year just stepping back and not getting involved. I can or... feel that from you. Yeah. There's nothing magical that we can anyone can do to make this go away. This is part of life. And it's part of the sacrifice of loving. So this feeling you have of that's actually love, which is like really crazy, right? <laughs> but love is painful, like in this way, where you care so much about for someone, but you can't yeah. do it for them. That feeling that you're, you have that sadness is actually love because otherwise you wouldn't be sad. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be grieving. Yeah. And this is part of the cost of it. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you for explaining some of those things. Oh, well, it's easy for me. <laughs> and I'm very glad that there are people like you in the world. I, I'm not saying that. I know that sounds like cliche, but I, I, I really am. And I love that you care so much about fairness and that you want to help people and that it hurts you when you can't save them. That's real. That's moral goodness. And it's it's hard and it's painful, but that's part of, again, like love and goodness. This is the cost, but it's a beautiful pain. Yeah. I wouldn't want to change myself that way. Yes. And, And notice this great desire to help others comes from partly, I mean, sometimes it feels like a burden, but partly it comes from your childhood. Like yes, no one was there for me. Yes. And you've turned a really ugly thing into a beautiful thing. But now it's hopefully you're hearing that there are parts of you that need you now because your your work is directed out of you to others, which is great. great. And they're desperate for you to be there for them. I can see you know what that means. Mm-hmm. And that's beautiful. <laughs> the next level for you is inside. It's just like going yeah. down. And I think you're getting there. So you're on the right track. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was a pleasure and honor talking to you, getting to know you. Uh, Keep in touch. Well, yes, I was. Uh, I really enjoyed being able to connect with you, and uh, I thank you for all of this, those, all the different podcasts and different uh, things you've had over the years. It's uh, been actually quite interesting to watch you grow to who you are. Thanks. Thank you. It's really gratifying knowing someone's watching. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I have a lot of stuff. Thanks. Likewise. All right. Well, well, keep in touch. Let me know how things go. And if you have any other follow-up questions, just send it to that same email and uh, I'll be happy to, to field anything. That sounds good. Well, thank you very much. All right. My pleasure. Have a good night. You as well. 